Uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Erik uh, Larsen. Uh, he works for Earth uh, Analytics. He's uh, a doctor in uh, geology from the University of Bergen. Um, and he works with the development of uh, machine learning uh, software for uh, within geoscience uh, in Earth uh, Analytics. So let's just get to the point. So I'll talk about machine learning with uh, well data. I thought that was a, a good place to, to start today. And I have three examples. Uh, we're predicting porosity, we're predicting shear wave velocity, and then finally lithology. And uh, the main uh, message of the talk is uh, to give some tips and tricks on how to cope with imperfect training data, which seems to be a, a feature of the world that we, we live in. So can we use uh, wireline logs as a proxy for the properties that we really do care about, like porosity, impermeability, etc.? And we know already that we can, because we do this in uh, petrophysics where we use uh, physics equations and empirical equations to do that exercise. And one of the challenging uh, points by doing it that way is that there are uh, constants and variables in these equations that we do not necessarily know. So we have experts that know a lot about how to tune these constants and variables. And they need to be tuned to the local uh, context of uh, the wells that we are exploring. And they also need to be tuned multiple times in, in each interval of each well. So obviously, this takes time, and it's an expert-driven approach. And we also know um, that we can do the same kind of job with machine learning. And we've been doing this for uh, at least a couple of decades, also here in Norway, where we can choose from a vast uh, amount of algorithms, just define a feature set and a label, select the algorithm, tune the hyperparameters, etc., and make models that predict the property of interest. So the point now is that we want to apply these techniques uh, at scale, and therefore it is convenient to, to have some software that helps us do that, that links our analytics software up to some database or data platform systems, and that exploit uh, cloud compute resources basically allows us to scale this kind of approach. So the point of the talk is a case study we did for ConocoPhillips, or Peter here, in the North Sea on 271 wells. And we're predicting a porosity, shower velocity, and lithology. And the feature set is wireline logs. And we have three different label sets. So one is human labeled lithology logs. The other one is porosity data from CPIs generated by petrophysicists. And the third one is the measured shear velocity logs. So the data set looks typically like this for a, a typical well with a rich suite of uh, logs, which is uh, standard in, in the North Sea um, and the three different features. So when we start attacking each of these three problems, there is a lot of things that we can do to search for the model that we finally want to apply to do our predictions. So we, we can choose from a catalog of algorithms. Uh, and we need to train the algorithm that we choose. We need to tune its hyperparameters. We need to retrain it. We need to select the features that go into it from those numbers of logs that are available to us. We need to select our so-called label the property that we want to predict, or to train on and to predict. And there might be issues with the quality of this training data. So we might need to go back and, and do some cleaning of that. But that. Eventually, after running this loop multiple times, uh, we'll end up with some model that gives us the, the best score that we can achieve in the available time. So for shared sonic prediction, uh, these approaches, they work like, really well, just straight out of the box. Uh, and we can quickly uh, get acceptable results with a large number of algorithms with, with fairly minimal efforts. And with porosity prediction, it's also fairly straightforward to get good results. It requires perhaps a little bit more tuning since the, uh, the training data is CPI data, uh, which is done by experts. 
but we can quickly get up to R squared values in the in the 90s uh, or 0.9, where one would be perfection. And by visual inspection of the prediction versus the the actual, we we see that we do pretty well. So just, let's just move on to the problems because they're always more interesting. And there are some issues when it comes to classifying lithology this way. Because we have lithology data from near the seabed all the way down to TD in 205 of these wells. And this lithology is assigned based on core, where we have that, based on cuttings information, and based on wireline log information, where we don't have anything else. And this labeling that we call it of these facies is t done by uh, human experts that, that do as good as they can. But it's a difficult and a huge job to do. So the occasional mistake will obviously sneak into the data set. So the first thing we did in this project was just to take the data set, run it through uh, some uh, workhorse model, the random forest, that tends to give uh, good results without too much tuning. And we see that with this data set, that just doesn't work. So we get an R F1 score of 0.53. Also here, one is perfection. And when we look at this image here on the side, which is called a confusion matrix, we see that there is basically a lot of confusion. So if everything was perfect, all the predicted labels would equal the original labels and plot on the uh, diagonal and the blue squares. And we see that a lot of, a lot of data points plot uh, off the diagonal. And that means that there is a mismatch. Uh, and then we can go and look more closely at a plot like this and see that when the true label is such and such, it makes a, mis a common mistake and predicts it as something else. And we can judge whether we care about this mistake or not. And when we do that, we see that many of these confusions are basically irrelevant because it's confusing to uh, lithology names that are practically the same. So there is scope to group some of these lithologies to a smaller set of classes. And <clears throat> so now we need, obviously, to go and look more closely at uh, the data we've got and see what we can do with it. So after the traditional removal of spelling mistakes, we managed to take the size of the data set down from 38 classes to 22, which is a good start. And when we look at these 22, we see that there are many that are the same. So there's a whole bunch of classes that are variants of silty mud, muddy silt, etc. So obviously we'd like to group those. And we see another problem, that some classes have very few data points. So they're very scarce, so there's not much data to train on, and therefore hard to make good models. So either we can choose to just leave them out, or we can choose to go, go back to uh, our database and, and gather more data from wells that have more of these samples. Uh, we'll also explore the, uh, each of the classes uh, in, the, in the feature space uh, of all the wireline logs that's available to us, like plus cross plot everything against everything else and see which classes are overlapping, which are distinct from each other and so on. So, so based on this kind of exercise, we can reduce the number of classes in a meaningful way and end up with a smaller uh, label set. That, and we have control of the way we do it. And we can end up with something that is fit to purpose. So we still segregate the classes that are important for our use case. So now we just threw the data set at the random forest model again. And still we see that there's a lot of confusion, but anyway, the score went up from 0.53, I think it was, to 0.82. So this simple cleaning exercise has given us some improvements. But we still see that we're not able to predict the conglomerates, and we counted the conglomerate data points in the training set, and there's basically very few of them. So it's really hard to, to do that with so little data. And we see a problem with the silt stones. So when the 
original label says we have siltstones. Sometimes we predict sandstones, sometimes we predict mudstones. And that's kind of an inherent property of siltstones because it's intermediate between the two. So it's prone to make mistakes either way. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, in this data set, we saw that, oh, it's making mistakes for coals. And why would it mis make mistakes for coals? Because coals are probably the easiest one to spot for a human. It's got low density, slow, slow rocks, etc. Uh, so what we do is that we make a flag that identifies where the prediction does not match the input data, and that flag will guide us to locations in the data set where there are candidate mistakes. And a candidate mistake might mean that the model made a mistake, or the training data was wrong, or maybe even both. But at least it guides us to places where we could look and, uh, and try to improve things. So when we looked at this part of this well, we see that the model predicted coal, but the training set was sandstone and siltstone. And when you just as somebody who's used to looking at wireline logs, look at that, you see that the density is really low. These are slow rocks, resistant rocks, etc. So it looks like a mistake in the training data set. So you go in and fix that and improve the quality of your training data set. And luckily, we do have core. So you can use this flag again, identify candidate mistakes that are in core intervals. And you can look them up uh, and uh, check the core images and make judgments of whether you need to update your training data set or if your model made a mistake. So when you go through it like this, you're gradually improving the quality of, of your training set. And you'll train the next generation of models on, on basically better data. So then you, you can go on to do the feature selection so from this collection of logs that you have. You can choose to combine them whatever way you want. And there is a huge number of possible combinations, so this kind of never ends. So, uh, But you can try out different things and see how it affects the blind test scores. Uh, you can also generate more features that basically grows this exercise even more uh, by engineering properties as a function of the logs that you have in the beginning, like for example creating an, a window around your point of interest. In this window extract some statistical properties which will be new features of the original log set. So then you can grow your data set to an enormous uh, amount of features. And you can uh, now, uh, after doing those kind of tuning exercises, uh, optimization exercises, run a new model, and uh, the main impact of the improvement that we, we saw here is basically this uh, the cleaning of the label sets, because that, that's the nature of many of the label sets that we are exposed to in in petroleum geoscience, that they they do benefit from a bit, a bit of cleaning. So now we get up to the F1 score of 98, it's worth pointing out that it's not directly comparable to the others because we're not comparing the same original label set. And so you can then write this production model output curves back to your database, data platform, and note that there is this kind of symbiosis between the platform and your analytic tools that you take the features from the platform, you do the analytics, you get your predicted curves, you write them back, and in this loop, you grow the content of your platform. You get more and more predicted curves. On the way, you get metrics of the quality of those curves. And in the process, you get to clean your data by this approach that we just went through. And it's important to do this uh, integration and this whole workflow in a reproducible way. So for all the models that we uh, build, we store all the models also back to the database, including all the metadata that tells us how we built them, which feature they took, uh, how we tuned uh, hyperparameters, and every aspect about how the modeling happened. So then you can go to some curve, predicted curve, and you can track it back where that prediction came from and everything that happened. 
So you can run this loop over and over again and eventually cover basically all the wells on the Norwegian continental shelf. And you'll end up with a, in a nice situation where you basically can go ask your database interesting questions because it will have all the porosity curves, it will have the lithology curves, the facies curves, etc. So you can say, like, uh, please give me the porosity distribution for a certain uh, block, for a certain stratigraphic formation, a certain depth interval, and you can even specify that you want this prediction only for your fluvial channels, and there it produces a porosity frequency distribution which you then can take into your volumetrics, probabilistic volumetrics, and now you're one step closer to having purely data-driven probabilistic volumetrics and data-driven uh, decision support. So, and unfortunately the time is almost out, so thanks a lot for your attention. Big thank you to Eric. Uh, any questions? Eric, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, you didn't mention uh, saturation in your presentation. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation, by the way. But uh, I guess uh, saturation uh, changes. If you have hydrocarbons in your uh, in your rock, that would affect some of the parameters that you use as input to your. Uh, to creating a model. So do you account for that in any way? Uh, thanks for the questions. We, we've heard it many times before. And the answer is that we don't uh, correct for it. But in your feature set, which also includes uh, shallow, medium, and deep resistivity, there is implicit information that basically allows the model to take care of, of that calibration on its own. And so we have done the tests, because a lot of people have asked this question. So we checked that how well can we predict porosity in the water zone, in the transition zone, in the oil leg, in, in the gas zone. And uh, it just turns out to, to be handled by, by the machine learning algorithms with rich feature sets. So there's no, no need for manual tuning. Um, so I had a question as well. Um, did you have a lot of um, different um, drilling mud conditions in these wells? Because I have done this with some wells in California, and we had some with KCL muds and some with um, LSND muds or whatever, and it actually made a pretty big difference in the lithology predictions. Did you see any of that, or was it pretty consistent in the data set? This is 270 uh, wells from the North Sea, so there's a lot of differences in the muds that were used, and also differences in the logging tools that were applied, and some were from the uh, 70s and some were recent. So there are differences like that, uh, and, uh, but we have not included in our feature set information about the drilling, drilling mud or the logging tool. Uh, so the results here are just representing how the models can uh, work with the data that was presented to it. So we're not optimizing for that. But you can insert information about those kinds of features if you have it. But it turns out to work pretty well without doing it in these kinds of feature sets. Thank you. <laughs>